case we're going to talk about today is of a 75-year-old man with high-risk localized prostate cancer. His cancer was diagnosed because he had an elevated PSA on a routine exam. PSA was about 35 at the time of diagnosis, and uh, he had an abnormal DRE exam. When he underwent a biopsy, he ended up having a Gleason grade group 5 cancer. And importantly, he underwent a staging CT and bone scan that demonstrated that he appeared to have localized disease. He underwent treatment with radiation and a prolonged course of androgen deprivation therapy for his high-risk disease. His PSA, that again had been somewhere in the 30s at the time of initial diagnosis, actually declined to be undetectable by about six months after he initiated therapy. However, as he continued his androgen deprivation therapy, his PSA ultimately started to rise, so that about a year and a half after he started treatment, his PSA was again detectable. At this point, he had some back pain and hip pain, and he had a PSA that was almost 30. Unfortunately, he underwent staging CT scans and a bone scan at the time that demonstrated some lymph nodes that had started to become enlarged in his pelvis and retroperitoneal area, and he also had some bone lesions. He ultimately was diagnosed with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer at that time and was started on enzalutamide. He tolerated the enzalutamide relatively well, but unfortunately had progression of disease with a rising PSA about eight months after starting his enzalutamide. At that point, he underwent staging CTs again and bone scan and was found to have progressive adenopathy on his CTs as well as progression of bone disease on his bone scan. He was started on docetaxel chemotherapy at standard dosing and received four cycles. But during that time, he ultimately didn't tolerate treatment very well, developing some pitting of his nails, some neuropathy, and some fatigue, um, and, and stopped his treatment with docetaxel. His team considered other options for therapy and ultimately started him on cabazitaxel chemotherapy at the 20 milligram per meter squared dose with prednisone daily. And he was also given GCSF or Nulasta to support his bone marrow. At this point, if we consider this gentleman's prognosis, we recognize that he was diagnosed with an initial high-risk localized prostate cancer, and while he was getting his initial therapy that we hoped would cure him of his disease, he had progression of disease. He developed metastatic castration resistance while on initial androgen deprivation therapy, which is actually a quite poor prognostic sign. His second sign of poor prognosis was that he only lasted in terms of disease control on enzalutamide for about eight months. So enzalutamide in the first-line metastatic castration-resistant setting can typically last, or we hope will last, at least 12 months and sometimes a little longer. And for this patient, disease control was only maintained for eight. These are two signs that this patient, unfortunately, has somewhat of an aggressive disease, and we know it's already metastatic, making his prognosis somewhat poor and making it very, very important for us to find a highly effective therapy that uses a different mechanism of action than an androgen receptor-directed therapy to really hit the disease down and allow him to maintain quality of life and disease control. It's important to consider in metastatic prostate cancer that biomarkers are a critical aspect of our treatment decision making. Biomarkers can include things like DNA repair defect markers, uh, and this is important in any metastatic patient, and we would determine this with germline genetic testing as well as somatic genomic testing of the tumor tissue. So both of these are really important in understanding whether there may be a targetable DNA repair defect mutation. We would target these mutations with things like PARP inhibitors, and in the third line metastatic CRPC setting, this might be a good opportunity to use this treatment. When we think about other biomarkers, things like ARV7, I wouldn't necessarily use that, that marker in this patient because we already know that the patient's been exposed to enzalutamide and likely has a, a cancer that's resistant to an androgen receptor-directed therapy. Having a test that showed that he did or did not have the expression of ARV7 wouldn't necessarily change my decision-making around giving him another AR-directed therapy. I, I wouldn't do it because I already know that he's developed resistance and actually has developed it in relatively short order. So that's not a test I would order, but certainly I would order genetic testing and genomic testing to make sure that I understood if this patient had a DNA repair defect that could be targeted. When this patient was tested for DNA repair defects, he did not have anything in his germline or in his tumor tissue that was targetable with a PARP inhibitor.